America has voted, but the outcome of the presidential election is posing more questions than answers. Above all, who can reunite and reconcile this bitterly divided nation? Trump or Biden? Can America's next leader heal the country? Or has the divide between the two Americas become an abyss that will finally mark an end to what was often known as the American century? On To The Point, we ask Trump or Biden, how divided is the United States? Thanks very much for joining us. And my guests today here in the studio are Soraya Sahadi Nelson from KCRW Radio Berlin, who says the results show how disconnected American voters are from each other and from politicians, pollsters, and journalists. Also with us is Mosey Secret, freelance journalist and currently a fellow at the American Academy here in Berlin. He argues that a deadly pandemic, months of racial upheaval and scandal after scandal have done little to diminish Trump's popularity at the polls. And a warm welcome too to Matthew Kanichnik, chief Europe correspondent for Politico, who believes whoever wins in the end, the result shows that neither candidate or party has a clear, convincing mandate. Thank you all three for being here. Great stuff. I'd like to begin with you, Soraya. America has voted in what one leading financial broadsheet called a bitter US election that resolves little. That seemed like an apt and fair description of where we are. Do you agree? Absolutely. And it could be compounded uh, depending on the congressional makeup. It's mm. going to be very hard to get anything done. And there are just so many uh, varying narratives or varying uh, agendas. You know, it's going to be very hard for the next president to be able to latch on to those, uh, you know, especially if it's Joe Biden, who has said that he's going to bring the country back together. Sure. Why, why are we still waiting for a result? Um, part of it is because it's an, a historic turnout. I mean, the numbers are just huge, mm. including the um, mailed-in ballots, which, of course, have, depending on the state, have some time left before they can be counted. So all of that, when you have a system that is largely handled by volunteers in 50 different states with 50 different systems, you know, it takes time to count them up. Who's going to win? Oh, the tough question. <laughs> um, uh, we, as we speak now, um, Biden has taken uh, taken back uh, Michigan, Wisconsin, um, and appears poised to uh, uh, win in Nevada and in Arizona. Uh, he seems to have the clearest path towards uh, 270 electoral college votes. You talk about a clear path, but it is a system that doesn't really appear to work for, for, for European eyes. Why is it so complicated? Uh, well, we have to, to, to look to the framers of the Constitution for that, I think, but we have an electoral college system that, um, that for whatever reason, is weighted toward uh, parts of the country that are less populous, and so it often does happen that uh, the, the greater number of people uh, vote for, for the candidate who has the fewer number of electoral college votes. And um, we've seen that in previous elections. Matthew, I'd just like to run that question by you. Why, you know, why is this system still in place? The electoral college, nobody really understands it. And the postal vote is, an, is a sort of an, an opportunity to call fraud. It, it, you know. Well, I think there are a couple of things. First of all, I, I would argue that the electoral college system uh, does work and, and has worked for over 230 years. Uh, it has happened in the past. It happened in 2000 and it happened in 2016 that the candidate who won the most uh, votes uh, did not win the election. But the point of the electoral college system is to have a regional balance in the country. And it's important to remember that the United States is twice as big as the European Union in terms of its geography. Mm. It's a country of 300 million people. Uh, more than 300 million people. And they wanted to avoid a system, the framers did, and I think that they could sort of sense this was going to happen back then even, that the country was going to expand westward. And they wanted to avoid a situation where you had uh, large population centers determining who was going to run the federal government. And it is, it's a federal system like Germany, and they tried to create this balance. Barack Obama won two terms as president uh, with the Electoral College and with the majority of the votes. And I think that if Joe Biden wins uh, today or in the coming days, that this talk about doing away with the with the electoral co electoral college will probably dissipate. I think that 
the big problem this time was because of the pandemic, you have many more mail-in ballots than we normally do. That's one problem. And the other problem is, is that the president of the United States is aggressively so, questioning uh, the on, integrity on. of these mail-in ballots. This is all fascinating background, but, it, you know, you're giving the impression that all is bright and rosy in the US a couple of days after an election where we're still wringing our hands and saying, where the heck is this going? Yeah, but I think it is normal in the American system, and I think it's not normal to European eyes, as, as you've said. It's not. Uh, but the fact is, is that the responsibility for elections in the United States lies with the 50 individual states, and they're allowed to structure those elections in the way that they want. There are, as Sarai said, mainly volunteers who are working here to uh, count the votes. It is actually, I think it's, a, it's very positive for democracy because it is, it's a grassroots effort. And when, when people see, as, as we saw this morning in my home state of Arizona, sort of groups of people out in front of the uh, building where they're counting the votes, waving Trump flags, and you know, they're carrying guns as a lot of people in Arizona do anyway, that you know, tends to, to worry a lot of uh, European uh, viewers, I think. And American but, viewers. And American American viewers, but I do think that it is also maybe a little bit part of the kind of circus atmosphere that often surrounds American elections. Well, I, I don't agree about the, the Electoral College. I do think that that will remain a, a sticking point as somebody who's a California voter. I mean, I am, feel disenfranchised, frankly, by the system that is very antiquated that was created 230 years ago. And I think with the with what we've seen with this election, with the uh, mail-in ballots, the overwhelming, you know, the ability to do voting in different ways. Um, that uh, Because the idea was, behind the Electoral College, was to make sure that all states were represented. But you can reach the voters now. We're not talking about going by horseback to, you know, some polling station, God knows where, you know, fighting all kinds of uh, dangerous elements, although there are still dangers <laughs> in some places nowadays uh, when you want to vote. But, but I do think that they're going to... I mean, that there's going to be pressure to end this. I really don't... Be, it's just a very strange system when you have a popular vote that goes for a, a candidate and then they still can't be elected because the electoral, uh, you know, college system is what prevails. OK, just one second. The, uh, I mean, I think it is fair to say that the complications of the system were partly what prompted President Trump to come out and make his extraordinary speech claiming to be the winner of the poll. Let's listen into that and then talk about that a little bit. We want the law to be used in a proper manner. So we'll be going to the U.S. Supreme Court. We want all voting to stop. We don't want them to find any ballots at 4 o'clock in the morning and add them to the list, OK? It's, it's a very sad... It's a very sad moment. To me, this is a very sad moment. And we will win this, and we, as far as I'm concerned, we already have won it. Moses, your take on what was going on with the president there? What was his message? What I hear from in the president's words is, is someone who, whose path to victory has narrowed, uh, but who seems intent on rallying up his base um, to do God knows what, uh, to um, preserve... Um, um, uh, his voice uh, in the public discourse as, as, as Biden uh, kind of inches closer, closer to victory. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of talk among journalists and pundits about framing the narrative, and a lot of people have been saying it, it's, it's sort of framing the narrative of, a, of a, an, an autocratic narrative. Is that how it feels to you? I mean, the president comes out and says, you know, he almost himself declares himself winner. Since when does one guy choose the president of the United States? Uh, when we talk about challenges to democracy, a, 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 a kind of a naked appeal to stop counting votes of, of, uh, of American registered voters does seem to be leaning to me towards um, um, kind of authoritarian um, uh, kind of rule. Um, various things that he's done to to kind of stoke violence um, at the polls, to to call out people who um, um, to to show up at the polls with 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 their arms on display uh, appears to me to be something that is that is against totally against what we would consider a working democracy. A presidential coup in the making, some say. Regardless of whether Donald Trump, you know, wins another term in office or not. Is that cheap talk? Is that extreme talk? I think it's ex a little bit extreme. I mean, I do think that the United States has systems in place to prevent one man from sort of staying in, in the White House. I mean, even though we may see the, the visual uh, putting up of barriers around the White House, I thought that was very <laughs> symbolic. I mean, maybe it wasn't intended that way, but maybe it was intended that way. But I honestly don't think that, I mean, he, you know, he... 
Donald Trump talks the way Donald Trump talks. That's part of his appeal. You know, he's seen as a leader by his followers. And I think that's meant for them when he says that. Um, whether, and even let's say for a moment he does want to stay and will stay no matter what, I don't think those around him are going to allow that to happen because of the institutions, including the Supreme Court. Well, I agree, and I think it's interesting that he actually referred to the Supreme Court in that clip, so even he respects the authority of the Supreme Court here. Uh, I don't believe at all that the Supreme Court is going to just rubber stamp whatever he wants it to do, and it's not even clear what he would be asking them or what he would be challenging. And again, it's worth remembering that this situation is not in his hands now. It's in the hands of the states where these um, ballots are being counted. It's their authority. The federal government has if, no authority if, over if that If he process. loses the count, is he going to go? I think he'll go. Absolutely, he'll go. And I It'll think he'll be, be as easy as that. It'll be as easy as that because even people in his own party, the the leader of the Republicans in the Senate, Mitch McConnell, said, "Of course, we're going to have a normal transition of power, just like we've had since the founding of the republic. There's no reason to think that we wouldn't do that." And I think that many of the Republicans, actually, uh, the, 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 the the sort of establishment Republicans, would be happy to see him go. You know, I mean, they they, they, they don't uh, seem to be particularly happy with his with his style either. And the other thing is that they've already gotten most of the, what they wanted. They have control of the Supreme Court now. They have control, more or less, of the federal judiciary. I think they would be more than happy to see the back of uh, Donald Trump. Interesting. Let's try and capture the mood of the time by listening to four American voices. I'm here to support our president. I think he's done a fine job despite the pandemic, despite it all. He's done an incredible job. I, I'm very frightened for America. I'm very frightened. And I love our democracy. I love America. And I don't, it has nothing to do with the party. I just want somebody to look after America and our democracy. That's very important to me. Trump is doing nothing for us. I feel that he's going to have everything more under control than what um, Trump does. I vo voted for the greatest president in history, Donald J. Trump. The best president in history, Donald Trump. What are his uh, signal achievements? <laughs> um, changing the way presidents talk. I mean, I, I don't know. He's he's been able to shake up transatlantic relations. He's been able to to bring back some of the jobs that he said he was going to bring up. I mean, I don't want to sound like a Trump defender here, mm -hmm. but but he has definitely left a mark on not just uh, uh, America, but the world. Mm -hmm. And I don't think uh, that's going away. I mean, it's not being swept away into the uh, trash bin of history, as uh, Monica Hess wrote in the Washington Post. Mm -hmm. But that's why people also vote for him, because of these accomplishments, which I think, you know, often get get lost in, in, just, in, in just a lot of Just remind me again, the, the accomplishments. You had a, plural, a plurality of accomplishments there. I'm interested. Yeah, I, I, and I think this is, you know, exactly why his voters are coming back, why his base really wants him to remain. He cut taxes dramatically. Uh, he, he also did away with a lot of regulations that uh, was you know, good for the business community. He raised military spending dramatically. These are all things that he promised to do in the um, campaign of 2016. He's taking a tough stance on trade with China. Now, we might all think that these are not good policies, or many, many people might think that, it, you know, that these are, 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 are wrong-headed, but this is exactly what he promised to do, and he, he, he followed through. He also promised to bring the deficit down to zero, and that hasn't gone so well because the country has a higher debt than it ever has. Moses, do you feel comfortable with that little lot? Uh, e it's difficult for me to, to, to hear those uh, accomplishments and, and not think about um, children of migrant families who were separated at the border and, and, and not think about um, uh, Trump's kind of open acknowledgement of white nationalist groups uh, and not think about um, the kind of voice of voices of the voice of support that he gave to white nationalists in, in, in Charlottesville. Um, there are just so many things that, that, I, that I see as, as um, abhorrent, really, that make it difficult for me to, to, um, to consider those policies as, as, as worth supporting. That's all right. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm more inclined to agree <laughs> with what Mosey said. I mean, I think that, uh, yes, while he did bring more spending to the military, what he's done to NATO, for example, and moving of troops, and even like with Afghanistan, this forcing through of, uh, of, a, of peace talks that are not necessarily going anywhere, I, I think that's 
a real, you know, issue or, or problem. And so I don't think that the changes he's brought, I mean, you know, with the tax cuts and everything, that's fine. He has done that. He has made a change that I think we will feel for, for many, many decades to come. But I don't think that these were necessarily successes. Yeah, this, is the problem. This, is a, this is a subjective analysis. And I'm just saying, objectively speaking, if you're trying to understand why so many people have voted for him, why, you know, essentially half of America is still supporting Donald Trump, it's because when they look at what he did, and I forgot to mention the judges on the, on the court, this was a huge thing for his base, that he managed to put uh, three new Supreme Court justices into place who are going to, you know, take a much different view of issues like abortion potentially and other things that are really core to the uh, to the, the Christian base. I mean, I'll give you the su Supreme Court, but I don't think it's a subjective analysis to say that Afghanistan's falling apart or that uh, the deal with Iran, the situation with Iran is somehow better. I'm not you saying know. it's better. I'm saying that so. this is exactly what he promised to do. He said that he wanted to get out of the Iran deal or signaled that he was going to get out of the Iran deal, which he did. And I'm not saying whether that was good or bad, but he also said that he wanted to end the so-called endless wars. He hasn't managed to do that, uh, but he has kind of avoided an escalation in both Ira uh, Afghanistan and, and, and Iraq, and he hasn't started any new wars. So I, I, I just think it's worth remembering, you know, people are wondering, well, especially in Europe, well, how could anybody vote for this guy? Well, look at his record. Look at what he promised to do. And you might disagree with his policies, and you might think that, you know, he did a lot of other bad things. But if you look at what his base wanted and what he promised his base, he delivered for them. One leading German correspondent came out the other day and said that he has done much more for peace in the Middle East than Barack Obama, for example. Well, that's not a very, you know, high bar, to be um, honest. So, <laughs> um, I just want to talk about... I just want somebody to look after America and to look after our democracy. That was what one woman said in those... We just had that report with those four statements. And uh, I'm just intrigued to know, and we'll talk about that now, is that somebody who could heal America, Joe Biden? Let's watch this report first of all, and then we'll talk about Joe Biden. Joe Biden was the youngest candidate ever elected to the U.S. Senate. In 2009, Obama named him his vice president. Vice Biden, president a man with decades of political experience. As a presidential candidate, he's presented himself as the antithesis of Trump. We choose hope over fear, unity over division. Science over fiction, and yes, truth over lies. I'll be a president who will stand with our allies and friends and make it clear to our adversaries the days of cozying up to dictators is over. It's estimated that nearly another 210,000 Americans could lose their lives by the end of the year. Enough. No more. Let's just set partisanship aside. Let's end the politics and follow the science. That's the job of a president, to heal. Mosey, can Joe Biden heal America? Does America need Joe Biden to heal it? So, I, I, I'm... This is the role he is being cast in. Yeah, I, I look at the returns as, as they exist right now with, um, with uh, Joe Biden with about 70 million votes and, and, and Donald Trump with about 68 million votes and, and see a very stark divide um, that uh, is perhaps beyond what, uh, what, uh, what Joe Biden can do to heal. I mean, I see Joe Biden as, as, as a palatable kind of figure who many kind of diverse groups could um, unite around, but he does not strike me as someone who is um, um, strident or or um, or visionary or even kind of truly progressive. So I, I I do I do wonder if he is often described as a man of great empathy. Um, that that goes a long way coming from where we've been in the last four years. Someone who was able to kind of understand that other human beings have have feelings and needs and, and it's is kind of not entirely driven by, um, you know, personal ambition. Mm -hmm. um, that will certainly make a difference, but, but still that divide seems so great um, that, I, that I wonder, I really wonder um, if, um, if, he can, if he can manage it. Sorry, what are your personal insights on Joe Biden? Tell us about him. <laughs> I mean, you know, for me as a as a woman, you know, as a as a you know ethnic woman, you know, person of color, I he just it's 
another white man, old white man, telling us what to do. It's hard not to feel that way, uh, you know, even though I do think that he will restore, um, I believe anyway, based on what he's saying, that he's going to restore some dignity to this office, you know, that there aren't going to be these harsh tones in terms of relationships. I think relationship building with our um, allies is going to improve. I think transatlantic relations will improve uh, under him because he will go back to the format I think that people are used to. But I, I don't know that he, I, I don't think anyone can come in and solve anything in four years. It's, it's the, These problems are long in the making. This is not just about Donald Trump. Or, and what he brought, um, and so he's got it's quite a task. Often said that he doesn't have a great record when it comes to it. That you know, we we talked about the achievements of Donald Trump, and when you look at Joe Biden, five five decades in U.S. politics, and it's a short list. Now you sound like Donald Trump. <laughs> no, I, I think he I, he's actually achieved you know a lot, and I mean, but he he is going to have to spend the next four years trying to undo some of the things. I mean, you know, the United States not being in in the uh, Par uh, the climate Paris, I'm sorry, the Paris Climate Accords, which yes, uh, which on November fourth is when. The, um, America officially pulled out. It was sort of uh, salt in the wound of uh, the elections uh, on the 3rd. Um, you know, these are things that he has to sort of undo, and it, that takes time, and he's not going to be able to do that uh, if, if uh, he becomes president because of a Congress that's likely to be divided. You talk about the fact that he's a man, that the other candidate was a man, that both of them are, are males of, of high age, yeah? Um, <laughs> Is this going to be a one-term presidency if Joe Biden does come in and the, the strategy is that he will then be followed by his vice president? Um, I think he al always planned on it being a one-term. I mean, that, that is what he's indicated. Um, I think it may be a one-term presidency for Democrats, um, frankly. It's, it's just the bar is very high. And as we've mentioned, um, you know, President Obama had a difficult time during his six years when the Senate was controlled by the Republicans. It doesn't seem likely that that would change now. Mm. You mentioned two words in one sentence, Biden and legitimacy, and you seem to be su suggesting that he would not have uh, legitimacy or full legitimacy in office. I think he'll have legitimacy if he if he wins the election, but he won't have a strong mandate, which I think is what a lot of people were hoping for, especially in the U.S. among the Democrats. They wanted a so-called blue wave that would give them control of both houses plus the presidency, allowing for a very ambitious program of reforms. I think it's what a lot of people in Europe were also hoping for, to kind of revive the transatlantic alliance, to do away with all of these tensions over trade, to do more on the environment. And I think, you know, Biden will reverse the decision to pull out of the Paris climate deal. But beyond that, it's going to be, I think, very difficult for him with the divided Congress to, to make much headway. And he's going to be under constant attack from Republicans in the Senate who can block a lot of, you know, what he's trying to do. And he still has to deal with the, the Fox News onslaught and all of these things. So I think he will be very exposed. On the other hand, I think that he also, just because of his personal demeanor, he does bring a degree of normalcy back to the presidency and hopefully back to American politics that that has been missing. And if that is his main achievement, you know, that's that's uh, better better than nothing. Given what you were just saying about Donald Trump, does that uh, give you some comfort, that vision of what Joe Biden can achieve in the years to come if he does become the next US president? You know, I, I, I do take some comfort in that. I, I think that, that, that even with um, a divided Congress and the difficulty that he, that he will have making um, policy changes, that, that um, President Trump has been so disruptive to um, normalcy and in international relations and domestic relations, and really just the way people feel every day um, um, having him as their leader, that I think that it, it will be, it will be, there will be a collective sigh of relief um, just that Donald Trump is not in office. Mm. When you talk about Donald Trump being so disruptive, are you, can, can you, are you, are you as sure as Matthew is for uh, appears to be? I think that. This is somehow going to play out peacefully in the days and weeks to come. You know, I, know I, I, I hear the claims that he won't leave, but it's difficult for me to imagine that kind of scenario. I mean, it just it doesn't it doesn't feel realistic to me that he will not leave the office. I can't imagine. I mean, is he just going to sit there and, and and no one's? It just Lock doesn't. In the White yeah, House. it doesn't really <laughs> it doesn't really make sense to me. Sarah? Yeah, I, I don't expect 
a coup d'etat or whatever or that we're going to have to go in with or that someone's going to have to go in with guns to bring them out or whatever. I, I, I think, think on it's the other hand, if you out. want to be an optimist about it, it's a great example of democracy. All of this is unfolding before our eyes. We're watching these counts come in live on television. You can see the people counting the votes. This isn't happening in some back room, you know, it's not Belarus where they're throwing the ballots out the back window and, and uh, that kind of thing. And, you know, we'll have a result. It's his, it's his right as the candidate to challenge the result, to ask for a recount in Wisconsin. He's, it's within that margin. And, you know, if the courts have to decide in the end, the courts will have to decide in the end. But, it, you know, that's the way it works in a democracy. Okay, fascinating views, fascinating insights, incredible. Uh, the dust hasn't settled on the US election quite yet. Uh, well, let's wait and see what happens in the days to come. Thank you for joining us here on the programme, To The Point. Uh, do come back next time round. Until then, bye-bye and tschüss.